Jeremiah chapter number 20. We're going to begin our reading with verse number 1. Read down to verse number 9. And it reads as this, Now Pasha the son of Emmer the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. And then Pasha smote Jeremiah, put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord, a place where everybody would see him a place of humiliation, a place of embarrassment. And the Bible says it came to pass on the morrow that Pasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks. And then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name Pasher, but Magor Miss Abib. Now if you were to look those words up in strong, Pasher is a name that uh, symbolizes freedom. Are being free. But, but Magor Misabib, that is interpreted or translated one who is a terror on every side. That would be a little bit more important in just a minute. But in verse number 4 it said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. And they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city, and all the labors thereof, and all the precious things thereof, and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give into the hand of their enemies, which shall spoil them, and take them, and carry them to Babylon. And thou pasture. And all that dwell in that house shall go into captivity. And thou shalt come to Babylon where thou shalt die and shalt be buried there. And all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. O Lord, thou hast deceived me. And I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone that mocketh me. For since I spake and cried out, I cried violence and spoil because of the word of the Lord that made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. And this is a very familiar passage. But Jeremiah said, Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary in forbearing, meaning I tried to hold it in. I tried to stop myself. I tried to withstand the fire. But I liked the last part, and I could not stay. I held it in as long as I could hold it in. But sooner or later, it came out. Amen. I, I want to preach to you, if the Lord will help me on this thought. Hidden fire. And in the words of Brother Jimmy Jones, preached our camp meeting, he'd say, I can look at you and tell that don't mean a thing in the world to you right now. But just hold on just a little bit, and it'll all make sense. Amen. Hidden fire. Let's pray tonight. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for the Word of God. It is quick. It's sharp. God, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is a fire shut up. In my bones. Father, I'm asking for the unction, the anointing, the empowerment of the Holy Ghost to declare what thus saith the Lord tonight. Anoint us to hear, to receive, and to respond. God, I'm asking for a manifestation and a demonstration of what I'm preaching about tonight. Father, I don't just want to preach about it. I don't want them just to hear about it. But God, I want us all to experience it tonight. Oh, let us leave with fresh fire from heaven. Father, we're going to give you praise, honor, and glory for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray it. And the church says amen. 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 I'm not one that puts too much stock into New Year's resolutions. Maybe because it's because of all the years that I made them and two weeks into them. It was gone. I resolved to do better, but my resolve wasn't that strong or something else come up and 
took its place. So I, I really don't put a lot of stock in the New Year's resolutions, but there were two things this year that I said, with God being my help, I want to do better in. And number one was, I want to be a better friend. Because being as busy as I am on the job and in ministry, there are a lot of times where family and friendships uh, suffer because of it. People that you were thick with, you found out, it seems like you, you see them and it's two years before you ever talk to them again. And I know that the phone rings both ways. It rings on my end and on theirs. And I know that the visits, it's just as close for them to get to me as it is for me to get to them. But I know that my, my business and my schedule, it has hurt some friendships. And the Bible says if a man wants friends, he must first show himself friendly. Right. So I said, God, this year, it's simple. But help me be a better friend. But the second thing that I said was, Lord, this year, if you'll help me, I want to read, study, uh, examine your word and uh, listen to more preaching, fill myself up with the gospel more so this year than I've ever done. And so I've, I've been trying to study more, been trying to read more, and I, can't, I cannot take credit for this story. But some weeks ago I heard the story and it, it, it jumped out at me and it, it wouldn't let me go and I, I tried to uh, dig up a couple of other things for tonight's service and I just could not get anything to flow. And in prayer this afternoon, it just it, it was reminded of this story. And these verses come to me. In the Winter Olympics in 1998 in Nagano, Japan, I was a, a 10-year-old boy. And really, it's the first Olympics, Winter Olympics, that I can really remember anything about. Uh, I remembered the, the, the Olympics that they had, remembered all the the pomp and circumstance, but I, I, I heard a story that transpired and happened at the 1998 Nagano Winter Olympics in Japan that was a, a, not in the headlines. The Olympians were getting all of the, the publicity, and rightfully so, they dedicate their life for what uh, just that, that small window and moment of fame. But there was something that transpired at these Olympics that was uh, out of the ordinary. There, they experienced terrible blizzard conditions. And the blizzard was so bad that they actually had to shut down the mountains where the slalom and the downhill and all of the, the ski activities were, were going to take place. They had to shut them down and to delay the Olympics for several days because of the blizzard conditions. It was terrible uh, snow that was falling. The wind was atrocious. So they had to, to cancel and shut some of those events down that was scheduled to take place. But when they shut it down, they noticed something odd and strange. They noticed at the top of the mountain that there was a little grove of cherry trees. Japan is known for their cherry trees and their cherry blossoms. But in the middle of these frigid winter conditions, with blizzard, with snow falling, with wind in excess of 50, 60, 70 miles an hour on top of that mountain, they noticed that there was a grove of cherry trees that were in full bloom. And as they began to study those trees, they said, this isn't supposed to happen. Here's a grove of trees that is known from being spring and summertime, just like any other natural fruit or natural tree that would display their beauty. They're not supposed to bloom in the middle of a blizzard. They're not supposed to bloom with uh, several inches and feet of snow that's fallen in the middle of the Winter Olympics. So just out of curiosity, they consulted some horticulturalists sent them out there to explore the trees. Why are these trees blooming in the middle of winter? Why are they blooming in the middle of a blizzard? The horticulturalists were stunned after days and weeks of investigating the trees. They come up blank and said, 
We have no clue. They called in some, some scientists and began to, to study what, what is special about these trees, what's causing them to bloom. They come back with nothing. So they were puzzled, began to scratch their head. What is going on? Somebody had the bright idea. Why don't we call a geologist in? Why don't we explore what's going down beneath the tree? Maybe there's a story to tell. And they called some geologists in and they began to, store, uh, to study the rock formations. And they began to study some old fault lines. And what they found is this is that down beneath that tree, it was on top of a dormant volcano. And what they found out after studying is that miles down beneath the earth, that dormant volcano that had been dormant for years, upon years and years, it began to come back to life. And right beneath that grove of, of cherry trees, there was a natural air vent to where the heat and the steam was coming up from that old volcano that had been dormant for years. And so it wasn't too hot that it was causing uh, death and, and, and danger to the trees. But the steam and the heat from the, from the volcano was telling those roots, it's time to bloom. It was telling those trees it's time to blossom. It's time to put off your beauty. It's time to put off uh, that beautiful fragrance despite the external conditions that was detriment to life. Despite the snow, despite the, the, the blizzard, despite the wind, despite the calendar, despite their time uh, schedules and uh, everything being off, uh, there was a fire down under that tree that was given off uh, steam, that was given off mist, uh, that was given off heat, uh, amen, that was conducive uh, for those trees to live. Uh, and there was life produced on that tree despite uh, the adverse external conditions, uh, despite uh, what was going on all around it, uh, amen. You see, what was inside uh, and what was under uh, those trees, uh, it was far greater than what was outside of the trees. Amen. What was hidden? What was buried on the inside of them? Amen. They had life. Amen. When there wasn't supposed to be life. Amen. There was fruit when there wasn't supposed to be fruit. There was beauty when everything else was barren. Hallelujah. Amen. You hear me, churches, Holy Ghost filled believers. The same should be said and experienced by us. The fire of the Holy Ghost should burn and produce life in us, even in the harshest conditions. Even though religiosity would tell you you can't have revival anymore. The moves of God are extinct. While there's more churches closing than what's being birthed. While there's more people leaving the ministry than there is joining the ranks. The natural man would just say to quit and give up. The conditions are too harsh. The climate is too cold. Amen. There's no way life can come in the middle of winter. But I can tell you folks if there is a hidden fire on the inside of you, if what is inside of you is greater than what's outside of you, we can't have revival. We can't have a move of God despite, amen, the adverse conditions. Amen, if we have the Holy Ghost, we have everything that we need to produce life and to bear fruit. Amen. It wasn't supposed to happen in Nagano, Japan. And people will tell you it's not supposed to happen today. But can I tell you, there is no excuse for a fruitless, blossomless, fireless church. If the fire of God's Spirit is in us, then we have everything that we need to channel the life of God. We should bloom when everything else is dead. 
Oh my God. We should have life and produce life when everything else is decaying. It matters not what's happening externally. Our answer is internal. Our answer is what's been birthed in us. Our answer is what we've been filled with. If you were to ask those cherry trees, don't you know you're not supposed to bloom? Don't you know it's the wrong season? Amen. They would tell you nothing is out of season. Amen. There's a fire down here. Amen. What's in me is greater. Amen. Than what I'm experiencing out here. The same must be said for the church. More than ever, we must preach about this fire. Oh, God help us. More than ever, we must preach and experience what for so many has been written off and labeled as dormant and said that this is an inactive volcano. Oh, God had moved in the past, but He don't move like that anymore. God sent revival in years gone by, but that's out of style today. Oh, let it be that that fire begins to build up again. Oh my God. Let it be that that fire begins to bubble up on the inside of us where that which was can be again. Where that which was can be again more than ever. We must preach about this fire. What's hidden, what's dormant, it doesn't have to stay hidden, friend. It doesn't have to stay dormant. It doesn't have to stay buried in the heart of the earth. But if God puts something in us, sooner or later, it is His will for that to bubble up and come out of us. Amen. There must be a hidden fire on the inside of us and in the church where once again we rise up and we bear fruit and are fruitful for the kingdom of almighty God I feel God in this house they ask Admiral Hiramoto here his name escaped my mind but the architect of Pearl Harbor they sent two waves of bombers into Pearl Harbor And they were ready to send a third. But he declined and called off the raid. He said, we've lost the element of surprise. And they asked him, they said, Admiral, have we achieved our mission? He said, on paper, yes. But I'm afraid all that we have done is awaken a sleeping giant. Amen. VJ Day in 1945 when the giant arose. Amen. And Japan surrendered. History proved them right. Amen. What would happen if the sleeping giant arose in this hour? The church of the living God. We've been poked. We've been prodded. We've been ridiculed and made fun of. We've been called archaic. We've been called extinct. We have been left for dead. But it's time for that hidden fire to begin to bubble up again. It's time for the church to arise and bloom where we haven't bloomed for years to give life when life seems to be gone to be the church that God has called us to be external factors has no bearing when we're full inside of the fire of God hallelujah you look at Jeremiah here's a man arrested, put in stocks, put at the high gate beside the temple in the house of God. They wanted to humiliate this man. They wanted to ridicule him all because he was given a word from the Lord that they didn't like. There's a lot of we can preach about right here. But he was smitten, ridiculed, embarrassed, mocked. You look at his life, the embarrassment, the weight of the situation was great. These were external factors that would make a lot of men want to quit. Can you imagine being put on display in stocks beside the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. 
for millions to come by and ridicule you. It would be easy to say, I'm out on that. Don't want that. The external pressure is enough to make a lot of men fold. And a lot of men want to quit. And Jeremiah, he was a natural man just like you and I. He felt the pressure. He felt the weight. It was all riding on his shoulder. At one time, he experienced freedom. But now he's experiencing terror on every side. Pasture has passed. God said that window of opportunity is all a facade. We're no longer calling him pasture. We're calling him a name. This means he's producing terror on any side. That'll make a lot of men want to quit. But I can tell you the same way there was a hidden fire in Nagano, Japan. There was a hidden fire on the inside of Jeremiah. It burned despite the opposition, despite the pain, despite the embarrassment, despite the terror. He said, it would be easier for me to quit. It would be easier for me to just stop and never preach again. Oh, that would have been the, the path of least resistance Amen, for Jeremiah to take. And he tried it. He tried to hold his peace. He tried to forbear himself as much as he could. He said, I'm not going to preach it again. I'm not going to speak in his name again. Oh, but that hidden fire began to bubble up. When the pressure on the outside was at its greatest, the fire on the inside burn greater. Amen. And Jeremiah said, I can't do it anymore. I can't quench the word of God. I can't quench the fire of God. Amen. It's like a fire. Shut up in my bones. Amen. The Amplified Version said, Amen. I won't speak in His name. But then, it becometh in my heart as a burning fire. And I weary myself to hold it in. But I can't endure it. I can't contain it anymore. What was hidden on the inside was put on display for everybody to see on the outside. Oh, there must be some Jeremiah's in our day that'll let the hidden fire erupt and what's burning on the inside. Don't quit him. Don't grieve the Holy Ghost. But let that fire bubble up and burn out for all the world to see. You look at Peter. I'm going to look at two examples and I'm done. In Acts 4, he spake to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees. They were grieved. They too didn't like what he had to say. So what did they do? They didn't just not like his Facebook status. They didn't unfriend him or delete him. The Bible says they laid their hands on him. They got physical with him. They grabbed him and put him in a hole, put him in prison. For now, it was even time. Listen, we like to put these men up on a pedestal. And I believe there are great characteristics that we need to look at, and I believe they are worthy of honor. But they were natural men, just like you and I. They actually had feelings. They actually had emotions. Persecution and opposition were very real and very difficult. The conditions for Peter like Jeremiah were adverse. But notice what verse 4 says. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men were about 5,000. You see adversity in the natural and the pressure externally will always fan the flames of revival. Why is it that a great revival is taking place in China? Why is it that a great revival is taking place right now in the Middle East and Iran and Pakistan right under the nose of the Ayatollahs and all of the Muslim extremists China's booming. The Middle East is blossoming. Why? Because there's a hidden fire. And the power of that fire inside of them 
is greater than the persecution that they're experiencing on the outside of them. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Why is America, amen, it's turning quickly into a post-Christian society. I can tell you why. We're at ease in Zion. There's not a lot of true persecution. I know that there are pockets. And I know that it's getting worse by the day. I am not turning a blind eye to it. But you compare our persecution to what's going on in Malaysia. Compare what's going on to China and Iran and Iraq. Where your head is on a chopping block just for mentioning the name of Jesus. Amen. We have a walk in the park compared to those soldiers of the cross. And we've fallen at ease in Zion. Oh, and that fire's beginning to, 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 to die out. And to wane and to wax cold. Amen. But where adversity that he is for the church. Uh, amen. Where that fire is kindled. Uh, where that fire is bubbling up. Uh, amen. There will be life. Uh, there will be fruit. Uh, amen. There will be a fragrance uh, of revival in the air. Even in places uh, where it should not be. Uh, because what's been burnt in us uh, is greater than what the devil is trying to put on us. Uh, and we can't have revival uh, right uh, under uh, his nose. They asked Peter a question. You see, Peter in the past didn't do well with questions. Peter didn't always come up with the best answers. They asked him, said, when they set him down in the midst and asked by what power or what name have you done this, flash back about 50 days, he was so offended by the name of Jesus Denied him three times and cursed. Said, I don't even know the man. And now he's gathered in front of the same house where he denied him in front of a fire on three different occasions. He's surrounded by some of the same people. Some of the same people that he was scared of 50 days earlier. Now he's put on trial. Now they're asking him questions. And in times past, when he folded like a deck of cards, now something was different. You see, this time, the first time, he was warming by a fire when they asked the difficult questions. And the fire and the heat only went skin deep. But this time, Brother Daniel, the fire had been birthed in him. It went to the innermost being of his soul. Amen. It wasn't something external, only skin deep, but it consumed every fiber of his being. From the top of his head to the sole of his feet, he was consumed. And the Bible says, right in the middle of the difficult question, right in the middle of the opposition, amen, ask him this question, and what name have you done this then? The Bible says, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. That hidden fire began to burn. What was on the inside began to purple up, bu bubble out uh, and said, you rulers of the people and the elders of Jerusalem. Uh, he began to preach to them. Uh, he began to tell them the gospel message. He began to preach Christ uh, and say, uh, there's no salvation in any other man uh, but the name Christ Jesus. Uh, you can kill all the rams, the goats, the bulls, and the turtle doves in the world. Uh, it's not going to wash your sin away uh, because the atonement uh, is in the blood. Uh, salvation is in Christ. Uh, there is no salvation salvation in any other name and the Bible said that when they saw these men they were ignorant and unlearned they could not read nor write these were not leading theologians or scholars they were on the bottom of the totem pole on the socio-economic ladder but they made one start discovery and note said so these men are ignorant and unlearned but they've been with Jesus how did they know because the same fire that he had was evident in them. The same Holy Ghost that Jesus was baptized with in the River Jordan, they were baptized with in Acts 2 in the upper room of Jerusalem. Amen. And they noticed what he had, they had. How he talked, they talked. The power he had, they had. What was dormant and what was hidden began to bubble up. And they could not deny the fact that these men had been with Jesus. Oh my God, would it be in this day that there 
there would be some uh, some men uh, that would get shut up with God. Uh, amen. And say, the world would look at us and say, uh, they're not uh, the smartest uh, uh, crayons in the box. Uh, they're not the richest. Uh, they're not the most fluent. Uh, but they've been with Jesus. Yes, hey! Hey! They've been with Jesus. They've been in a prayer meeting. They've been filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. What's hidden in us should become public once again despite pressures and oppositions. What God has put in us is greater than the pressures that the devil is putting on us. Hidden fire is not the will of God for that fire to stay hidden. It's not the will of God for that fire to remain dormant. Oh, but for there to be an expression of life. This fire enabled Peter to produce fruit. They told him, they said, don't you speak in that name anymore. Don't preach Jesus. But Peter and John answered, and so whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than God judge ye. But we're going to keep preaching. We're going to keep singing. We're going to keep praying. We're going to keep walking in the Holy Ghost. We're going to keep on kindling the fire. And God's going to keep on saving. Shun it in the God's going to keep on filling. God's going to keep on healing. You see, when we do our part, we believe by faith God's going to do His. Yes. You can beat us. You can starve us. You can freeze us. You can do whatever you want to do to this old flesh. But we are not letting the fire of God go out. Oh, hallelujah. May that be our testimony in this present day world. If they did it, we can do it. If they had it, we can have it. God is no respect of a person. It's time that we get filled with fire. It's time that we get filled with fresh high fire. Don't hide it under a bush. Don't try to conceal it. Amen. Don't try to hide the evidence, but put the evidence on fire for the world to see. If we're on fire for being Pentecostal, let there be evidence enough to convict us. Let there be power that the world cannot deny and that the world has to acknowledge that we have been with Jesus. God help us tonight. Let it be a reality. Got one more man, Paul. Paul was a man that knew about adversity. He knew what it was like to live in adverse conditions, in dearth, in death, in a winter season. Paul didn't go to luxurious places and live it up. Paul didn't build over another man's foundation. He went to the Gentiles. The gospel had never been declared before. If you don't know, that's like trying to plant and plow a garden on concrete. It takes a lot of digging. It takes a lot of nurturing. But Paul did it. You read his biography. Five times received I 39 stripes. Three times I was beat with rods. Once I was stoned. For I suffered shipwreck. And night and a day I've been in the deep. You read about his journeys, his perils, robbers, perils, his own countrymen, perils by the heathen, perils in the city, and weariness and painfulness and watchings and hunger and thirst. Don't sound like a bed of roses, folks. And he said, besides all of these things which are without, notice that. All of those are external conditions. All of that is winter conditions and blizzards that is stunning and impeding many people's growth. Paul said all of those things are without. And on top of all of those things, I carry the burden of all the churches. Not only do I have to deal with a bunch of devils in the world, I've got to deal with some hardships in the church. 
I've got to set folks down. I've got to straighten them out. I've got to disciple them. I've got to love them. I've got to correct them in a way that will bring God honor and don't make them want to pick up their chair and run out the door and never come back. But to correct them in love, to correct them in the anointing, to correct them to where God can still savage those broken pieces and make a masterpiece out of them. Listen, I can tell you, ministry, leadership in the ministry is a thousand times easier than leadership in the church. Because you see, Brother Joey has promoted a lot of employees to customer. They don't do what's right, you give them opportunity. There's a point in time where they cross the line I'm like him. I've never fired anybody. They've always fired themselves. But there comes a point in time people are always worth the investment until they're not. And when they're not worth the investment, you get them out and you put somebody else in that is worth the investment. But I can tell you, in God's economy, in the kingdom of God, you say one word to somebody they don't like, you never see them again. It's a, whole, it's a whole lot easier to handle things in the business realm than it is in the church realm. Paul walked that line. He had to deal with all the external factors. And then he had to deal with all the internal factors inside the church. Paul carried a very, very, very heavy load. And notice what he said in 2 Timothy, verse 4. He said, I fought a good fight. <laughs> I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul was a man under constant pressure. But the fire on the inside always burned greater than the fire on the outside. What was birthed in him was a whole lot stronger and a whole lot greater than that that was against him. Jeremiah, Peter, Paul, all three of these men experienced cold, barren, Detrimental elements, but all produce fruit right in the middle of it. They all were faithful to the cause, faithful to their calling. And God, the Lamb of God that was slain, he received the reward of the suffering from their lives. Gave all that they had unto him. Amen. Right now, I can tell you, folks, our world is in trouble. I got one yeah and one uh uh-huh. We're in trouble, folk. Economically, things are bad. Who would have ever thought that we would live in a society and in an economy where the cost of an egg is about a dollar? A dollar per egg. Right now, the grocery store, they're $9 all day long. Butter, milk, bread. Economically, it's bad. Cheer up, it's only going to get worse. This thing ain't going to get better. Sorry, it ain't on your parade. Economically, things are bad. Politically, things are bad. Corrupt to the high heaven. Medically, things are bad. 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, no health problems in the world, falling over dead. Periocarditis, myocarditis, blood clots, all going through the roof. Doctors don't know why. We got a pretty good idea. But we'll leave that alone. Socially, things are bad. Religiously, things are bad. It seems that America has gone from freedom to terror on every side. It seems that we've gone from Pasha to Magor Misabib. And the devil would love nothing more than for every one of us quit to cast away our confidence to throw away our shield but I can tell you folks the answer always will be what it's always been just because things are bad on the outside does not mean that we can't have revival on the inside and that which is on the inside 
funnel out and change the atmosphere of that which is on the outside. Those cherry trees in Nagano, Japan in 1998, they changed the landscape. They changed the fragrance and the aroma in the air. They changed, amen, despite the adversity of the elements and the external conditions, amen, that that fire changed the atmosphere. Folks, I'm telling you, the church is the answer. I'm going to say that again, the church is the answer. And what we have inside of us can change the landscape of everything around us. We can change the fragrance of this rotten, sin, sick world. We can change the beauty. Amen. We can change it all, not for our glory, but for, but for uh, the glory of God. Jesus said, Kirsten, come help me if, if you can. I'm done. He said in Luke 12, 49, I've come to send fire on the earth. And what would I if it were already kindled? You see, Jesus wanted to translate what was birthed on the inside of him. What was confined to one body and one shell. That's why he had to go to Calvary. For the sins of the world. To offer his blood as, as the redemption for man's sin. But also so that the veil of his body, his flesh could be rent in twain. So that hidden fire on the inside of him could expand to the world on the outside. It was on the day of Pentecost where that fire that Christ had, on the day of Calvary, He gave up the ghost. He gave up the Holy Ghost. He gave up the fire, that which was birthed in Him. They didn't take it from Him. He gave up the ghost. He gave it. Amen. He didn't lose it. Amen. It didn't succumb with Him. He, he gave up the ghost. Amen. And on the day of Pentecost, amen, He gave us the ghost, the fire of God. Amen. The hidden fire should not be hidden any longer. The message of Pentecost must be proclaimed greater than ever before. Amen. I just don't want to preach the message, but tonight, you hear me, this message is twofold. Number one, if you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, amen, now is how our time to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you're born again, amen, the fire that's been hidden to the world, by and large, is God's will for you to get full and that fire to erupt in your life and not to be hidden anymore. But if you have been filled, it's time to stir up the gift of God. It's time, amen, to stir up the fan the flame, to get that fire bubbling and running up again. We must be filled and we must be refilled. It's time for that which is hidden uh, to be hidden no more. Oh my God. Uh, it's time for that uh, which is a secret uh, to be a secret no more. Uh, but what God has done inside of us uh, it's time uh, that the world knows. Amen. How many will meet me in this altar tonight? Yes. Amen. And let's stir up the gift of God. If you haven't been filled, pray. Seek God until you are filled. And if you have been filled, don't leave here tonight until you've been refilled. Until the fire of God is ablaze in your heart. Change the fragrance in the church. Change the fragrance in your home. Change the fragrance on the job. Where there's death, let life flow. Amen. My God, it can be more than words tonight, but a reality. Come on, church, let's touch him tonight. Sing.